Thanks for joining us today at Lighthouse Outreach Ministries. We're lighting the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, listen today as Pastor Green shares some biblical truths that will shine upon the true light, Jesus Christ. I want you to turn, if you will, to Psalms chapter 19. And we're going to read verses 7 through 11 together. If you would, would you stand with me and take your Bibles and let's read the Word of the Lord together. We're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to read 7 through 11 together. If you you will, read with me. Ready? Let's read. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever, and the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned And in keeping of them, there is great reward. Thank you. You can be seated. Thank you. I want you to particularly pay attention to verse 9, part B of verse 9. Let's read it together again. The second part of verse 9 says, The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous all together. The judgments is something that we need to know about because they are God's judgments and God's judgments are what? They're true and they're right. Whatever God says in judgment is true and it's right altogether. In other words, there's nothing wrong with God and his judgment. It's all right and it's all true. His judgments are true. This is very important you hear this. His judgments are true. His judgments are right altogether. He's righteous. He's true. And so are his judgments. Now look at verse 11. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned. Who are the servants of the Most High God? Is the world, are we, the church? So by his judgments, we, his servants, are warned. When you get in the word and the word of God gets in you and you get in relationship with God, God will warn you when you're living outside or practicing something outside of his will. We received a warning last Sunday using the church at Thyatira where they were allowing the Queen Jezebel to teach and seduce God's servants, enticing and seducing God's people to commit idolatry and sexual immorality. And God warned this church very boldly last Sunday. It's not just to this church. It's to the whole church worldwide. God says flee immorality. Uh, Don't be, flee idolatry. Have no other gods before me. But he said in my churches, the churches are compromising and they're letting a demonic spirit called a spirit of Jezebel into the churches and letting her teach and letting her seduce my servants to not live in accordance with my word and my judgments, but the way they want to live, according to the flesh. And God knows that if we live after the flesh, we're going to perish. But if we, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the flesh, we shall live. I said, if we, through the Spirit, do put to death and kill and deaden off the deeds, the works of the flesh, then we shall live. And the works of the flesh are manifest. And they begin with fornication, 
and sexual immorality and adultery. The first ones listed have to do with sexual immorality. And we know that Jezebel was a queen in an area where there was all manner of sexual immorality there in Thyatira. So I'm not going to rehash that word. If you didn't hear the word to Thyatira last week, I know that I know that I know that it is a word to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ of today. And it was a very bold word, but it was God saying, release it now. He knows when a word needs to be released to the church. And his desire is his church repent. He said, if you overcome, if you repent and overcome, then I'll do this and I'll do that. There's a reward for heeding warnings concerning God's judgment. Because those that didn't overcome, what did I say was going to happen to them? What did I read? It says, and I will throw her and those who follow her, who are taught and follow her ways, I will throw them into great tribulation. Now, was God's judgment true and righteous? Yes, it was true and righteous. He was his warning for his servants. Yes, it is. I made, I need to make a correction. Last week I said there was only one church that didn't have to repent. Actually, there's two. One of them's Smyrna and one of them's Philadelphia. The other five churches all had need of repentance. So I was looking at the churches again and studying them this week, and I noticed Smyrna, they're thrown into prison for 10 days of tribulation, but they're not reproved for anything they're doing wrong. So actually there was two. I need to do a correction on that. See, even I stand corrected and I receive correction. Amen. We need to learn how to receive correction without getting mad about it. Today, we expect our children to take correction and act right about it when we ourselves as adults don't even take correction and receive it from God or the pastors. A lot of times people get mad because there's a word of correction given. But all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for reproof, for rebuke, for correction and instruction in righteousness. That's what the scriptures are for. Amen. Good to have you with us, Brother Bob, this morning. We're in Psalms 19. We just read Psalms 19, 7 through 11. So the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous all together. And by them is his servants warned. Now let's finish it. And in keeping them, there is great reward. When God warns us, if we will keep his judgments and heed them, the Bible says there's great re reward in it. And we see that in all of the stories, that all of the letters written to the churches. I want to read something to you. I wish these were my own words, but they're not. But I want to read something to you that God, I believe, gave me. You know, sometimes other people write stuff that when you're studying, God leads you to read it. And you, it didn't originate with you, but it originated with the Holy Ghost. This is what I want to read to you this morning. Life is filled with warnings. Warnings are given that we may avoid disaster. We're warned against bad choices and their bad consequences. We either heed the warning or we ignore it. Warnings are given in advance of our meeting the bad consequences from bad choices in order to give us a chance to change our choices and avoid the bad circumstances and experience good consequences. Do you agree? Things that are bad for our health have warning labels on them. Most do. But that doesn't stop people from consuming them. Highway signs warn of danger ahead and advise us to slow down. These warnings are ignored by many as well. A warning is an act of mercy shown by someone who doesn't want to see us experience the suffering that is certain to be brought on by our own choices. That's what a warning is. God's judgments are warnings to his servants. 
Amen? He warns us with judgments. So he doesn't want the bad things to become our consequences. He wants good things to happen, but he warns us about our choices that we're making. We make choices all day long, every day, about how we're going to live and what we're going to do with our life. Every day we're making choices that are going to cause us to live well or not end well, or have good consequences or, or not good consequences, bad consequences. A warning is a great arresting statement of God's inspired by his love and his patience. A warning that God gives us is given because he loves us and he's patient and he's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. So we see so many people, when you say, uh, be warned, here's a judgment, I'm going to tell you what we get back from the world that doesn't want to repent. Don't judge me. But the judgments of the Lord's are not our judgments. They're the Lord's and they're true and they're righteous and by them are the servants of the Lord warned. And it goes well for us if we heed them. If we don't, it doesn't go well. God warns us. The devil threatens us. I'm going to say that again. God will warn you. The devil will threaten you. God doesn't threaten you because he gives you free will. But don't think because God hasn't dealt with you in judgment that he's not going, he doesn't know what's going on, or that he says, it's okay. Just keep living in disobedience. It's okay. Everything's going to work out fine. That's not true. God warns the devil threatens. God warns us all the time. I got to tell y'all a little story right here. I walked out to the pool the other day. I was going to put in the Polaris to, to get up the leaves. I tried to get the little door open to put the, I don't know all the names of this. I've tried to open the little door to get the little thing to go in there so it could suck up the leaves. Couldn't get it open. My lame little brain said, Go get something to help push it to get it open. Well, it didn't have nothing wide enough as pliers, so I saw a hammer. And my head said, don't use the claw on that hammer to pull that thing that had these little, little things where I could, uh, I think I can get a hold of it and pull it. So I'll go out to the pool and my head tells me, I hear a warning, don't use that hammer because if you do, it could slip and tear a hole in the liner. But guess what I did? I took my hammer and knelt down, ignored the warning, took the hammer, claw, and pulled. And when I did, I tore a tiny hole in my liner. And I said, I'm so dumb. Why did I do that? Because I did not heed the warning of common sense. Or what if? What if this happens? So I took a risk that it wasn't going to happen, and I lost. It tore a tiny hole, so I had to order a little repair pet, little repair kit. Pay $14.99 now to repair my mess up because I didn't heed my own warning. I had a warning. I knew, I knew that I could slip. But I thought I wouldn't, so I tried it. And then I was so aggravated at myself for doing that. Y'all ever done stuff like this? I'm sure y'all have your own stories. A warning is given in advance of a disaster while there's still time to change our choice. See? I heard a warning, and I could have changed my choice, but I didn't. Or it can be, or it can't be considered a warning. If it's not given in advance, it can't be considered a warning. We are warned always in advance. Our conscious warns us in advance of wrong thoughts and wrong actions, but has no power 
after its warning to stop us from fulfilling our will. That's a mouthful. So our conscience will warn us when we have a wrong thought or we're about to take a wrong action in advance. Now, that warning will not stop us from making our choice and stop us from fulfilling our will. So we won't be able to blame God for not warning us. In the end, God's judgments are going to be true and righteous as they always are. And if he deems someone's not worthy to enter heaven, then he is just and right. They did not deserve to enter heaven because his judgments are true and right. The Bible talks about on that day when the Lord comes and takes his church home, there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Gnashing means grinding your teeth together. The Bible says there's going to be people weeping and grinding their teeth. I thought I was ready. But God says, I'm going to say to them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. You who continue to live in sin after I warned you and I warned you and I warned you and I sent you the prophets. I sent you the apostles. I sent you the pastors. I told you to repent and you didn't listen. Now you get the consequences of your bad choices. We, the church, better preach the fullness of God's word or else people's blood who perishes is going to be on our hands. That's a whole story about Ezekiel and how God called him to be a watchman to Israel and to warn them. When he saw judgment coming, when he saw the sword coming, he warned the people. And the people could either heed the warning or not. But based on what they did with the warning and how they responded to it determined their own consequences in life. And it was nobody else's fault but their own. If it went good or if it went bad. People who ignore warnings say they'll chance it and take a risk. They think the warnings might be wrong. That it doesn't apply to them. And maybe the person who gave the warning didn't even understand the danger they were warning them of anyway. That's why the Word of God is always our source. It is not our words. It is God's words. It is God's judgment. One time I asked the Lord this question. I said, Lord, I want to know, how do I keep from judging people? And the Lord spoke the simplest answer to me. He said, if they're my judgments, they're not yours. He said, if I reveal to you my judgments, they're not yours, they're mine. He said, seek that you may know my judgments and live. Well, the word tells us Everything we need to know about judgment. Matthew 7, 13 says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. Signed, Jesus Christ, Son of God. Was that a warning? Was that a warning? Was that a judgment? That was a judgment. He's telling us that we need to enter through the straight gate. That leads to eternal life. And he tells us there's going to be only few that find it. And then he tells us if we don't enter through the straight gate, there's a wide gate and there's a broad way. And he tells us it leads to destruction and there's many on it. Now, guess what? You and I have a choice. Which road you want to go on? 
the straight and narrow that leads to eternal life, or the broad way that leads to destruction. It's our choice on which path we walk, but it's our responsibility to warn as preachers and ministers of God. I'm tired of preachers and ministers who's cowards and get in the pulpit and won't preach the judgments, only the I love you, I love you, God loves you, loves you just like you are. No, we need the judgments. The people need the judgments. They need to know the judgments of God like this one. They need to know. It makes people feel uncomfortable, but it's better to feel uncomfortable and know the truth than to not know the truth and burn in hell. The King James Version of the Bible, which we use, is filled with warnings. I want to share a few of them right here. What are some examples of God's judgment? Great catastrophes such as Noah's flood as a judgment. Men were so evil, women were so evil, people were so evil in Noah's day that God had Noah to build an ark for the saving as many as who would repent of their sin and get on that ark. And then he said, I'm going to destroy the world that I've created and all that's in it. He's going to destroy all the people. That's a judgment. And the people were warned, but many of them mocked. And many of them did nothing. And many of them risked it. And they lost their lives, not only physically in the here and now, but eternally, there forever in hell to be thrown into the lake of fire. For eternity. For eternity. That's why he puts the story of Noah and the flood in there. It gives hope to those who obey, but it gives warning to those who don't. The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah is a judgment. We know what happened there. There was such sexual immorality, homosexuality, that the men lusted after not only the men, but even the angels that the Lord sent into those cities. Even when they were struck with blindness, they still gawped at men. They didn't want women. Men wanted men. Where do we live today? Where do we live today in this world where men want men and women want women, and it's against that which God created and is natural. It's a work of the flesh. He's already given us a warning with Sodom and Gomorrah. He destroyed it. He took the righteous out, just like he did with Noah and his family. He took them out and destroyed the rest. Sodom and Gomorrah, he took the righteous out, destroyed the rest. Well, he's going to do it again. He's going to take the righteous out and he's going to destroy the rest. The earthquake that swallowed up Korah and his followers. God let a natural disaster like an earthquake swallow, open up the earth and swallow up Korah and his followers. That was a judgment because of their iniquity, their unwillingness to heed the warnings and repent of their sins. The plagues of Egypt were judgments. And the evil that came upon other oppressors of Israel are represented in the Bible as divine judgments. By reading God's word, we can be warned in advance of how God will deal with us regarding any actions we take. You can say, well, this is what, how I'm living. And you can see whether God is pleased with it or he's not pleased with it. Whether it's holy and acceptable with him or whether it's unholy and unacceptable with him. But most of us already have a conscience that convicts us. We know we don't need to be doing things with warning labels. We know, but sometimes we say, but I'm not going to change. 
I'm just going to keep on doing it. And then when something happens, we blame the devil. It was not the devil's fault that I tore the liner in the pool. It was my fault because I had a wise idea that I knew better than to do it because if I slipped, I would tear a hole in that liner and I slipped. I took a chance. And there's people going to feel hell because they're taking a chance today. And it's not enough for us to just say, we're going to pray for them, church. Listen, ministers of God, it's not enough for you to just say, well, I'm going to pray for my family that's lost. I'm going to pray. No, you need to warn with God's judgments. It is true. Did Jesus say, I'll pray for you? Did Noah just say, well, I'll pray for everybody? God used prophets in the Old Testament. He uses pastors and ministers in the New. He uses us to warn. Now, I'll tell you what, and I believe what I'm saying. If your ministry, if you are truly doing what you're supposed to be and you're warning people, you're not going to have a huge following right now. But that's okay. Noah didn't either. Lot didn't either. Consider what Jesus just said. Straight and narrow is the gate. And few there be that find it. In contrast to how many people live on the earth today, do you think the rapture is going to be humongous? Zillions and zillions of people and billions of people in the rapture? But the Lord's always had a remnant. <laughs> He's always had a remnant. The Bible has many, many warnings for the unsaved. The warning it gives the lost is that there is a real hell that they will suffer in for all eternity if they die in their sins without Jesus Christ. People in hell today, there's many. There's many people in hell today. One reason, because they ignored God's warnings. When they heard they needed to turn or burn, they refused to turn, they refused to change, they refused to amend the way they were living, and they perished. And now they're suffering for their own will they're getting the consequences of their actions and it's horrible but God's judgments are true and righteous and by them is his servants warned but even we don't read labels and pay attention sometimes even we don't read road signs and pay attention curve ahead Slow down. Surgeon General has determined smoking cigarettes causes cancer. Now, if something happens to you, just don't blame the devil and don't blame God. Take responsibility for your own actions. Right? It's wrong, but it's true. If I don't eat healthy, I may become sick. I listened to a message this morning that I know God put me on talking about eating pig because I like some bacon slices every day of my life. I eat bacon almost every day, like two or three slices. I love bacon. And he just ruined my bacon. He ruined it for me. That this bacon, pigs have these worms. And they will get in your body. And you will think you have arthritis, but it won't be bursitis and arthritis. It'll be from the bacon you've been eating. 
God does not change his laws. How many of you like catfish? See, I'm not trying to put people under the law. I'm just saying God's already said that there's certain animals that are to clean stuff out and and uh so the minister this morning I love him. I've got the I even videoed it. I stopped to video what he had to say because it was so powerful. But it messed with me. It's okay though. Because one thing I know, God wants me to be healthy. And I want to be healthy. But that may mean that I need to change some of my eating habits. And choose, make better choices. You know, if we had sugar diabetes and we just eat sugar all day. Then we can't blame the devil. And if you go to the Word, God will tell us what we're supposed to eat. And then he said, well, some people come out and say, but God said that anything we can eat as long as we pray over it. We pray over it. He used an example. Your child gets up in the morning and fixes some sugary frosted flakes. Then they take three tablespoons of sugar and put it on top of the Frosted Flakes. Then they go to the freezer and get a scoop of chocolate ice cream and put it on top of the Frosted Flakes with the sugar. And then they take the caramel sauce and squirt it all over and the chocolate sauce and they proceed to eat it. Would you say that that's okay? That's fine? Just eat it? That's a whole different message, but boy, it messed with me this morning because God's warnings are there. God's warnings are always in his word. We have the story of Daniel where he didn't eat the king's foods. They were rich in this and rich in that. and He just stuck with his diet of fruits and vegetables and at the end of the test, his countenance and those with him fared better than those who ate the king's dainties. The Bible even says if you're given to much sweets, put a knife to your throat. The word don't play. And this is God's words. But we don't want to offend nobody, do we? No, we'll let people perish, but we don't want to speak the truth and offend anybody for heaven's sake. We need to be offended when we're in error. We need to say we need to repent and change and amend. Da, 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 da. I just, and with God's help, with God's help, you can do anything. I believe with God's help. And it'll take God's help in a lot of things. Let me go on before I get stuck here. When people ignore God's warnings and decide to take chance and risks, they will see that God meant what he said in due time. It may not be today, but in due time, they will see. The Bible has many warnings for the saved, just like the unsaved. God warned Israel. God warns Christians against disobedience to his word. I said this morning in Deuteronomy 27, 28, he gives us the blessings for obedience, the curses for disobedience. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, this is a warning he gives us as Christians. He says, I beseech you, brethren, to present your bodies. Touch your body. Your body is part of body, soul, and spirit. Your three parts. But your body is the physical part. He said, present your body as a living sacrifice. And present it this way, holy, 
that describes holy and acceptable. In other words, holy is acceptable. Holy means truly holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy dedicated to the Lord. My body is for the Lord and the Lord is for my body. Our body is not for sexual immorality. Our body is not for idolatry. Our body is not for lust. Our body is not for these other things that are fleshly. Our bodies are for the Lord. And we are to present. See, we get the choice. I get up today. I can present my body to the Lord or not. It's my choice. It's your choice. God's not going to take away your choice. He does not want puppets on a string. He wants a people who love him, honor him, and obey him, and trust him. Amen? And we get rewarded based on what we do. He said this is our most reasonable service, is to present your bodies as living sacrifices. And then he says this, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know what you're doing today? You know what I'm doing today? We're renewing our mind with the word of God. Amen. So that therefore we're not conformed to the world, but rather we're transformed. The Bible says you're transformed. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. So it starts with the mind. When we get the word of God in our mind, then we can come into conformity with the rest of ourself. But it has to be first be given the word, the warnings, the judgments. What is right, what is wrong. That's why it says train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old he'll not depart from it. The job of the parents is to train up the child, teach them the commandments of the Lord. Teach them when they're young so that they don't forget it when they're old. Amen? By doing this, by renewing our minds, we prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This word, it is the good, it is the acceptable, And it is the perfect will of God. How many of you want to live in the perfect will of God rather than the permissive will of God? Yes, God will permit you to do what you want to do, but that don't mean it's His perfect will for you and I. So in order to know what God's perfect will is, we find that written in the Word of God. The devil hates the Word of God. He hates the Word. He hates the preachers who preach the Word. If preachers will compromise, he loves them. He loves a preacher who won't tell the people the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help them God. You know, many preachers today, they just want to build a big church and have a lot of people follow him and brag on how many people go to church there, how many people got saved, how many people this, what's your numbers, and how big are you, and are you this, and are you that. All of that is vanity. It's vanity. What God says, or are you preaching the truth? Or are you compromising for the sake of your own reputation we all want a good reputation we all want everybody to love us don't we I don't want people to hate me I don't want people to want to have nothing to do with me but if that means I have to tickle people's ears to do it if that means I have to compromise the truth and water it down and not preach the fullness of the word thereof then it's not worth it because God's going to hold us accountable for what we've done and what we've failed to do. Not only what we've committed, but what we've omitted. There's people that are omitting saying things because they know people ain't going to want to hear it. And we're going to give an account to God. And His judgments will be true and righteous with us too, His servants. And if we do what He wants us to do, He will reward us. Our reward we may not get here. 
it just may be in heaven, but we're going to get a reward for, for, for pleasing the Lord and not men. We are not here to please men. Because if you try to please men and try to please God, you can't do both. So you have to make a choice about who you're going to please. Jesus told his followers, you'll be hated by all men for my name's sake. He meant all men that were unsaved and not followers. They're going to hate you. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. If they curse me, they're going to curse you. If they didn't want anything to do with me, they're not going to want anything to do with you. So toughen up. The world has been warned that Jesus is coming. He's coming again for the saved and that this world will be destroyed by fire. The Bible warns that this is going to happen. But because the world has never seen such things and thousands of years have passed since those warnings were given, then the world mocks our warnings. We say Jesus is coming. They say, show me the promise. I can show you the promise in the word, but his promises are true. He doesn't say we know the day nor the hour, but it tells us Jesus is coming. And he's coming. And he said, it says that the world is going to be destroyed not by water, but fire this time. 2 Peter 3. If you got your Bibles, turn to 2 Peter 3. header says be ready for Christ's return this second epistle beloved I now write unto you this is Peter in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us the apostles of the Lord and Savior so he's reminded them the holy prophets have already warned Now we, Christ Jesus apostles, warn you also. Know this first, that there shall come in the last days, what? Scoffers, walking after their own, what? Lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. That's what they say. For they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water did what? Perished. Are they ignorant? Willingly ignorant. So they're not ignorant as they didn't know. They're just willingly ignorant. They heard but they just chose not to, not to, not to believe it. They chose not to act upon it. They chose, and this is the choice people make every day. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto what? Fire. The Bible tells you that the heavens and the earth, as we know them today, is reserved unto fire against the day of what? That's a judgment right there. That's a judgment. That's a warning. That the heavens and the earth as we see them right now, this world is going to be destroyed by fire. And that's a judgment. And it's going to be against and perdition, not only uh, against the day of judgment and perdition of what kind of men? Ungodly people. That's what's going to happen to ungodly people. And that's what's going to happen to the heaven and earth as we know it. Now, back to God's patience. Every warning he gives, every judgment he gives, he does it in love and patience. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but he is long-suffering. Why is he so patient toward us? It's because... It's not his will that anyone should perish. Why is the Lord waiting right now? Because he wants one more sinner 
to heed the warning and submit and give their life over to Jesus and get saved. He doesn't want people to perish. And he's giving us every opportunity and chance. And that's why we, the ministers of today, we're here for such a time as this to warn people of the coming judgment. Don't refrain from warning people because I'm not popular. It's not about you. It's not about me being popular and people liking us. It's about people perishing and their souls either going to heaven or hell. The Bible says, speak the truth in love, for you are members of one another. Do not lie to each other. People go around, well, you're going to heaven. I just know you are. I don't tell people you know you are. We have a hope. And we read the word and we seek God daily that we may have life and life eternal. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. How do you know you're a child of God? Because the Spirit bears witness. But the Spirit also will convict us of wrongdoing. And He will lead us to repentance if we let Him. We can override the will of the Holy Ghost if we want to. We can grieve, vex, offend, and sadden the Holy Ghost if we want to. God's not going to make you do right. He's not going to make... He let me get that hammer. He let me go over and do it. He did not stop me. And I carried out my will, and I reaped the consequences. And had to order a kid, and now got to lower the water and patch the hole. (laughs) Hard-headed. We live in a society today that we think Burger King, have it your way, is the way God's going to have it. We think God's just going to put up with anything. He's not. He's going to have it His way. Or it's going to be the highway to hell. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And there is no other way except through me to the Father. See, it's either His way or no way. See, people don't like that. That goes against the rebellion that is in the hearts of men. And so they try God. They tempt God. It's not nice to tempt God. Because he's God. And his judgments are righteous. And they're true. And it's settled forever. They're settled. But the day of the Lord will come. As a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements, that's the things in the heavens, shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works, that means everything in the earth, that are in the earth shall be burned up. So, this warning here gives us time to prepare, and we will prepare if we believe the warning. A warning gives you time in advance to prepare for something coming. And that's why I preached last Sunday and I said this, get your house in order. Get your house in order. Your house is your body, your life. It begins with just you. You get yourself in right, everything good between you and the Lord. And live a life to set things right in your household. And when things aren't right, repent. Pray. Ask God to forgive us. Ask God to forgive you. It's not the worst thing. It's wonderful when you do wrong to admit that you've done wrong. It is. There's freedom in repentance. That's how we stay out from under condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. And there's not a period who are in Christ who walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. So there's a progressive walk with the Spirit that we must maintain on a day-to-day basis in order to not get back into sin. This is why he warned the church in the letters 
the church had started tolerating sin and exercising sin again. And he warned them, I'm going to throw her and her followers into the great tribulation. But you who overcome, you're going to be seated with me on the throne. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love when God, even if he needs to speak to me, to get on to me, to tell me that I've done wrong, I love for God to speak to me. I tell him, don't stop talking to me, even if you need to reprove me. Even if you need to correct me. Even if you need to rebuke me, don't quit talking to me. Tell me when I've done wrong. Tell me how to fix it if I can. And if I can't, then let me leave it with you. And turn it over to you. Do you know some things you can't fix? And that's other people. Ho! Oh, some things you can't fix and that's other people's hearts. So sometimes you just have to let go and let God like Noah did. Noah had to let go. He focused on his family. We need to focus on our families. Focus on your children. Focus on your grandchildren. Pray that, Lord, as for me and my house, we will serve you, Lord. That this, as for this house, we will serve you. Now watch verse 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved or come to pass. What manner of persons ought I to be? What manner of persons ought we to be? In all, here it is, holy conversation and godliness. Since we know we've been warned, we've been told what's coming, since we know these things are coming, what manner of persons ought we to be? Should we be holy in all of our conversation? That means in all of our lives, in all of our dealings, in all of our doings, should we not be holy in it all? Knowing that this day is coming where we're going to be judged and the judgments of the Lord are going to be true and right. And they're surely coming, just like Noah's flood, Sodom and Gomorrah, Korah and his followers. Looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, here we go, we look for the new heavens and a new earth. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a new heaven and a new earth because this one is going to become what this word just said it's going to be. It's going to be judged and those ungodly people who refuse to heed the warning will perish with this earth, with this heaven and earth. But we're looking because God has promised us a new, new heavens and a new earth. And we look for it. And he said what's going to dwell there is righteousness. That's what's going to be there. Righteousness. And those who are in Christ, he is our righteousness. He is Jehovah Sid Canoe. Come on. He is my righteousness. Our righteousness apart from him is filthy rags. But Christ is our righteousness. Our faith is in Jesus, amen, and what he did for us at the cross. He shed his blood. He did it for all mankind. He did it once for all. And anyone who will turn and repent of their sins and put their faith in Jesus Christ will be saved. Repentance is part of salvation. We cannot continue in sin so that grace will abound. We cannot continue in sin. He who is born of God does not continue in sin because God's seed is in him. He cannot, therefore, continue practicing sin. Doesn't mean you can't fall into a temptation if you're not careful. How many of you ever fall down and you didn't mean to? You slip down. You fall down. You didn't mean to. You didn't go out there and willingly do it. Sometimes we get a little careless. We get a little ahead of ourselves. We get in a little hurry and we fall down. But praise God, we have an advocate with the Father. Hallelujah. We have an advocate with the Father. And he said, 
if you sin, just confess your sins. And I'm faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And that's what the journey's about. That's what this life is about. Beloved, see that you look for such things and be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you. Look at verse 17. You therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things beforehand, beware lest you also being led away with the error of the wicked, beware lest you fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace. Grow in grace. What is grace? Unmerited, undeserved, unearned, favor of God. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So we, we heed these warnings. Um, and we give the warnings. I have more to preach. I just don't know if the Lord is going to want me to share any more of what I have today. Um, how many of you are enjoying the message this morning? I told the Lord I am thoroughly enjoying what you're giving. He gives the word, and we are his host that just serves it up. But the Lord is giving this word to us today, and I am so grateful. You know what? He'll keep giving word to a people who listen. When Israel stopped listening, God shut the prophets up. They didn't speak for hundreds of years because the people wouldn't listen. If we won't listen to God when he speaks to us through his written word, then what makes us think we're going to want to hear more from God or God's going to want to give us anything new or anything better? I believe this with all my heart. God is calling us to love one another. Amen. You say, well, I know that. Go to the next thing, Sharon. No, he says go back and practice. Do your first works again. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor like you love yourself. Go back and practice that again. Because we think, well, we've advanced through that. Even when we're not loving our neighbor. Even when we're not loving God and we're having other gods before him. And so the repentance, the repentant call is not only to the unsaved. It's to us, the saved. When you ask God, is there anything you need to say to me? Be ready. Open your heart and say, Lord, is there anything you need to say to me? You may hear him say, well done. You're living in accordance with my will. You're practicing doing what I've taught you to do, and I am proud of you. But on one certain given day, he might say to you, you know what, you need to repent of your attitude today. You have been ridiculous acting. You've been hollering. You've been cussing. You've been showing yourself in the flesh, and you need to get on your knees in that closet and repent of your attitude. I'm just telling you how the Christian life goes by experience. Sometimes God might say you've been running your mouth too much. You've been gossiping, you've been backbiting, you've been slandering people, you've been putting knives in people's back and kissing them on the cheek. You need to get in your closet and repent of your ways. Woo! Ow! That's true. We may be found to be the ones that need to repent, and that's okay, because God's judgments are righteous and true. And it by them is his servants warned so that we don't get the consequences of our bad choices. 
The Lord's already told us to put away gossip, put away slander, put away backbiting. We talked recently about clamor. Some of you came to me and said, you know what? I got to work on that. Praise the Lord. Because we are a work in progress. Come on, somebody say, I ain't perfect. Don't judge me yet. Because when we're judging everybody else, I'm sure of this, none of us in this room are perfect either. You may say, well, she's got this thing. Well, you got that thing, honey. And if you don't be careful, you will become whatever you judge. I've seen it happen. I've seen people hate what somebody else did and then they turn around and fall into the same temptation and do the exact same thing and even worse than the one they judged. Judgment doesn't belong to us. It belongs to the Lord. But we're to know His judgments. And we're to proclaim His judgments. We're to preach. But we're also to live in accordance with them. We live in the fear of the Lord. Amen. People say, well, why don't you do that? Because I have a reverent fear of God. Don't you? How can you go back and just do that again? Do you not have a fear of God? There's many people today that don't have a reverent and awesome fear of God because they say, well, God hasn't done nothing in a long, long time. <laughs> don't be deceived. God is not mocked. God will not be mocked. These mockers and scoffers, they're going to get what they deserve if they don't repent. But his patience and long-suffering is giving them time to repent because he's loving, he's patient, he's kind, and he don't want anybody to perish. But I'm going to tell you what, people are going to perish, and it's going to be their own fault for eternity. They'll spend in hell saying, it was my fault. It was my fault. It was my fault. It was my fault. I heard that word. I heard that warning, but I kept doing things my way. It's my own fault. Humble thyself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due season. We all need to humble ourselves that he may exalt us, raise us up. Amen? Amen? Make me more like Jesus. I want us to sing that song as we close this morning. Make me more like Jesus. He came to a world he created. He traded his crown for a cross so that we can have eternal life. How many of you... Today, that is the cry of your heart. Lord, make me more like you, Jesus. Less of me, if less of me means more of you, take everything. Let's stand to our feet this morning and truly go into the presence of God and offer our lives and our bodies up to Him as living sacrifices this morning before we leave this house today. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. Come on, just praise Him this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. We praise you, Heavenly Father. We ask you to move in our hearts this morning. We ask you to make us more like you, Jesus. And rid us of anything that would defile us. Came to the earth you created. You traded your crown for a cross. You willingly died. Your innocent life paid the cost. Just a little bit of one. Counting your shadows as nothing. The king of all kings came to serve. Washing my feet, covering me with your love. If more of you means less of me, 
Jesus, we thank you, Jesus. Would you bow your head with me this morning? Lord, we just come to you thanking you. I thank you for the word. I love your word, God. I thank you, God, for giving us your word. I thank you, God, for leading us into all truth. I thank you, God, that we have the promise from you that 
when the spirit of truth is come, he will lead you into all truth and you will by no means be deceived. I thank you for the promise we have in your word that greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world. That we are overcomers by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. Glory to God. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. Lord, today I thank you that we're gathered together here with our loved ones. And God, we're all turning our hearts toward you. And we're heeding your warnings. And we're heeding the judgments that have already been pronounced and those that are yet to come. And Father God, I just want to, I want to pray. I was watching yesterday at what's going on with Israel. And Lord, I know that there's much that Israel is going to face and is already facing. And there's many civilians that are being kidnapped, women that are being ravished, children that are being murdered, innocent people by Hamas, by those who love to kill. And Father God, we ask in Jesus' name, you said pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for Israel. And so, Lord, we come before you today to pray for Israel. And God, we pray that you will protect her, that God, you will protect her people. God, that she will come to the knowledge of the truth and escape the very snare of the devil who has taken her captive at his will. And Jesus, I pray that we would continue as the church to stand with Israel and as a country to stand. And God, we ask you to forgive us of anything that we've done as a people, as a country, for our country. Like Daniel said, I pray for me and my people, and I repent before you. Lord, forgive us, Lord, of the way we've sinned against you. And forgive us, Lord Jesus, of any way that we have sinned against your judgments and your people we are your people, but also, God, you've said that those that love Israel, you will bless. You said, I will bless those that bless her, and I will curse those that curse her. So right now, would you just say with me, I bless her. I bless Israel in Jesus' name. We bless her in Jesus' name. We hope you enjoyed today's message. To see more messages like this one, to support or interact with our outreach ministry, please visit our YouTube or Facebook page, Lighthouse Outreach Ministries. If you're in the area, come and visit us at 9437 West U.S. Highway 84 in Newton, Alabama. See you there.